All right. Okay. Well, let's let's make a stop. And we can join in. Well, who's there? Just active is there. Um, I was wondering um, if uh, God didn't give the law. So Moses actually, what he did was incorporate pagan worship into the Egyptian, what they were accustomed to in, mm. in Egyptian worship, mm. into the law, or what we consider the law. Um, I th I think to 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 get the whole picture, you you have to really look at the nature and character of God Himself, mm. how God allows us to do things our own way um, and God is always at work trying to bring good out of even the decisions that we do make and when you when you sort of read in the prophets and you read their uh, revelation of God they clearly state that God didn't introduce sacrifices and offerings um, so where did they get the sacrifices and offerings well I would suggest from Egypt and from the culture of the other nations that they were engaged with um, and it, it also says that they took with them you know idols to Moloch and and Ashtaroth and others even when they were going around the wilderness and and the first time you know Moses leaves them they end up making a golden calf and now they were trying to make an image of God that it wasn't that they were not wanting to worship God but they were worshiping God in their own way you know, and so they created an image to work in when what God wanted was, was a relationship. They turned down the relationship and chose the image. And then the whole system where they refused to come into a relationship with God meant the mediation that Moses became the mediator was never God's intention, but actually took place because of their their choice. Um, and it's, you know, John 1 says, you know, that the law came through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus. So what what happened? Well, did did God give Moses revelation? Well, he certainly had revelation when he was in heaven. And he was pretty angry when he came out of heaven and, and smashed the sapphire cube of that revelation and ground it into dust. Um to deal with the with the golden calf i mean it, it was you know pretty pretty severe um you know and from that point on you know he re-engages and what happens he writes the ten commandments now i i believe that they came out of his desire to have a people who would serve god's purposes and know god and therefore he introduced a series of things that would help them come into the protection of God's blessing and you know so I, I don't I think it came out of revelation because he had a desire for his people to be in relationship with God and not mess it up again so that they'd end up being destroyed you know that the consequences of their choices would lead them into destruction probably by the other nations that they would end up inviting in and they would maybe not just be destroyed physically, but they would be integrated within the other nations and genetically they would be destroyed. Well, obviously God's desire was to bring out of the seed of Abraham, uh, Jesus. You know, as So there was a, a seed wars have always been the sort of the, the warfare that's been going on between the enemy and God. Therefore, you know, the, the, purity of the seed was always something that God wanted to maintain. So I think Moses uh, bringing those things was to protect the integrity of um, their relationship with God, but they still refused. I mean, all the way through, they just refused. Over, they kept going back to their own ways, you know, and some of the, you know, they're obviously the, the actual 10 commandments, um, carries with it a connotation of if you have relationship with God, you won't need to do all these negative things to other people. It wasn't a thou shalt not, it is thou, you don't need to. You know, if you know God, you won't need another God. You know, it, it, 
that's the reality. But of course, they didn't know God intimately. They knew his way works, but they didn't know his ways. And I think you get that in described in, in, in the Psalms, you know, that Moses knew his ways, but the people knew his works. So they saw the miracles. You know, they saw the water. They obviously saw the manna coming out of heaven every day. They saw their clothes wasn't wearing out. And yet they still chose to do their own thing rather than accepting the promise that God had given them. Um, so God's at work with them, but they had to go through 40 years to allow all those people who chose to reject to die. You know, that was called God didn't kill them. But he allowed them to die so that a new generation would arise and come into the promised land with Joshua, who carried the intimacy with God, having lingered in the tent of meeting and experienced God and experienced God in heaven, you know, in, in ways to bring a different revelation. Um, unfortunately, you know, they continued to do their own thing, eventually even asking for a king. Give us a king like the other nations. You know, how many judges did they have to bring them back to the truth of relationship rather than, well, going after the Philistine gods and going after the Philistine women and always wanting something more, which was the DIY way. I mean, that was, that was the do-it-yourself method. You can have everything apart from God. You don't need God. You know, and that was still what they deferred back to. And then they everything got messed up. The consequences of their walking outside of God's protection were evident. And then they're like, oh, help, help us. And God sends them a judge. And whether it be Gideon or Deborah or, or any of the other judges, eventually Samuel, you know, Samuel sort of came out of eventually that, um, you know, because God then began to, you know, when he, they wanted a king, he needed a prophet to keep kings in place you know you don't see prophets before that in the same way you know because they had judges um, you know, so i think we do have this big big understanding which is well the law is god's idea to keep us in line rather than actually god wanted a relationship and of course when jesus comes he completely challenges the view of the law as an external set of things that they needed to con to do to give them a relationship with God. And he basically called that self-righteousness and challenged the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the different factions within Israel at the time. You've heard it said, but now I say unto you. So you think the law says this. In fact, he said, you know, you search the scriptures to find eternal life. And here I am and you reject me because you think it's in a set of values or beliefs or laws or principles or traditions that you've attached to it all. And actually it's, it's about relationship with me and you, the light's here and you're not seeing it because you're veiled in darkness because of your unbelief. Um, and all that stuff comes back to the same thing that they had chosen to do it their own way, you know, and, and Jesus had to deal with that and change their view of God. And even in the early church, you know, they were still trying to do it one way when God had opened it up to everybody. You know, they still wanted to keep it to themselves. Even though he told them to go to the ends of the earth, they weren't going. You know, and, uh, until, you know, he had to give Peter a vision and then Cornelius received the Holy Spirit, you know, without even being preached to. You know, and all of a sudden they start to realize, well, this is bigger than we thought, you know, and God's intention was the course that Israel would have been a light to the Gentiles and would have demonstrated this is what it's like to be in a relationship with God as a nation. Look at our blessing. Look at our prosperity. Look at our provision. You know, look at everything. And yet they messed it all up. You know, kept going back after other things, which, you know, sadly, you know, led to, you know, their divorce effectively. I mean, you know, we read in Jeremiah, God divorced them. You know, it was like, okay, if you want to keep being unfaithful, 
then you can choose to be unfaithful. Yeah. And so Jesus comes into a situation really where the whole nation is living under the misapprehension that they are the people of God when God had already divorced them. So Jesus came as the seed of Abraham to reintroduce what the true people of God would be, a people of faith. You know, and so Paul comes along and says, well, not all Israel are, are Israel. You know, the Israel of God are those who are now believers in Jesus, who has made one remove the wall of division between the old and the new and brought it back into one new man. So all could come back into this root, if you like, and be grafted back in to the rootstock, which was faith. You know, so we have this whole system. So it, it is a challenge. And I know so many people have been just brought up with you know, the Ten Commandments as God's laws and, you know, all the ceremonial laws. But people pick and choose. If they're really God's laws, then you should try and keep them all. You know, but people pick and choose the ones. And even now, people still think we're under obligation to the Ten Commandments. and We're not. It's like they were given to Israel by Moses. Grace and truth comes from Jesus. Well, under grace, there is no law, you know, and the law brings sin. So there is no need for sin or lost, lost identity. Now we have that restored in Christ. You know, so Jesus came to completely bring restoration and actually see a people. So the kingdom was taken from them and given to a people who would produce its fruit, as it says in Matthew. Um, and even then the disciples were still, well, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus is like, uh, don't you get it? It's like you're supposed to be witnesses. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and the ends of the earth. And it's just like, and they still didn't get it even after that. They were still only preaching to the Jews, not really believing that the Gentiles were included. You know, and so Paul comes along and challenges them and they're like, okay, yeah, this is the restoration of, of David's tabernacle. Worship is open to everyone. There is no longer one nation wineskin or one temple wineskin or one city wineskin. Now we are the wineskin and we all have the Holy Spirit poured out upon us. Yeah. So it, it was a sort of a, a huge change. Um, and it shows how hard it is to break down mindset. I mean, Jesus couldn't do it. I mean, I mean, let's face it. I mean, he, I, he tried to do it. And, you know, they still didn't get it. You know, even when he, until he was ascended, they still didn't get it. They didn't get it afterwards. You know, he had to then give them visions to break down those perceptions, to change those mindsets, to really realize that they were free from the law. You know, and even even when Paul comes along, they were still like, well, if you just sort of don't eat meat sacrificed to idols and don't do this and don't do this, just to make sure, you know, you keep all the Jews sort of on side, you know, which gave rise to the Judaizers who then tried to get them back under the law. You know, and even Peter came under that spell and Paul had to face to face challenge him. You basically, you're a hypocrite. You know, before all this lot came, you were quite happily eating with the Gentiles because effectively there's no reason not to. And then they came and then you're you're withdrawing and going back to out of fear. You know, so it was such a powerful mindset. You know, when when Paul said, you know, in Romans chapter 12, you know, do not be conformed to the world. That's what he was talking about. It wasn't the word cosmos that was used. It was the word eon which was literally a, a the prevailing view of that age, which was the old covenant view that they were having to fight. So effectively, it was the Roman and the Jewish view, the, the, Herod, the leaven of Herod and Pharisees, which he warned them about. And, you know, Paul was basically having to challenge them to all of that, um, which was, it just shows how powerful religious mindsets are. You know, and if Jesus couldn't change their minds, it's like that shows how powerful it is and how deceived they could be. Even in the light of the truth being with them, they still believed lies. 
You know, they still didn't come out of their into freedom. You know, so it shows how strong our beliefs can be. You know, and all the evangelical beliefs that we have been I was brought up with certainly how strongly ingrained they are to produce a system of religion you know, rather than relationship and you know how many Christians are just going around living under the law trying to please God and appease God because they think he's angry with them by their behavior you know by reading the Bible praying every day witnessing totally out of fear because they think God is going to punish them if they don't toe the line. Sadly, that's brought, again, a, a return to bondage, you know, which the church, there are certainly the religious institution of the church, Christianity as a religion, is a religion of bondage. Because basically it's put people back under the law of dead works. You know? Uh, it's strange that um, even though a lot of evangelical churches are going back to the whole ritual and mm. of, the, of the law there. And now when the Methodists came, they, they removed, even the cross, they removed everything from the church. It was just a bare <laughs> pulpit and chairs. And now it's, um, yeah, they brought back all the paraphernalia and the Ark of the Covenant there and the menorah and <laughs> everything is there. Yeah. But eventually it all crept back, you know, and that's the sad thing. You know, it, it crept back from the relational <clears throat> to the religious and the ritualistic, you know, and sadly, that's always what the enemy will try and do to bring us back under the old covenant so we don't live in the freedom of the new. And all those systems of belief, whether it be financial systems and all the tithes and terumas and all that stuff, all, all going back under the old covenant um, rather than being free to give in the new with generosity and with as God wants. You know, so much of it just goes back. All the, all the priesthood, you know, and the vicars and the priests and the, all, those, all that stuff, what does that do? The Pope go back to the old covenant system which is just harping back to what Moses had to do because they didn't accept the invitation to relationship, you know, all the coverings of men and the hierarchy and all that top down system is going back under the old covenant system. You know, and sadly, that's what a lot of Christians and I've been there, done it, had the hat and the t-shirt, you know, that was, that was the only thing you knew because you didn't have an intimacy with relationship that revealed grace and truth. You know, you were you were living according to a set of values and all the denominations, the different streams, whatever you call them, all have their own liturgy that you have to fit in, their own values that if you're going to belong, you have to fit into. So they bring you back into, again, a bondage to a system of religious belief, which Jesus wanted to set us free from. So it's a continual renewing that needs to take place to make sure we're not operating in those religious systems uh, and particularly not operating uh, in respect to the law. You know, we just create our own laws. We have our charismatic laws. We have our Pentecostal laws. You know, we have our faith movement laws. We, yeah, we have our new covenant apostolic laws i mean essentially it's all based in here is a set of doctrines and values and theology that will keep you safe now you know and we don't need any of them we just need an intimate personal relationship with god in which together we can be built together as living stones yeah, building each other up in love not trying to conform to a particular model, image, way of doing things um, that's not relational. Mm -hmm. That's the sad thing. All law becomes non-relational you know, in which we have to be free from that to enjoy the freedom of relationship. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I remember reading books like Philip Yancey's, you know, The Jesus I Never Knew. 
you know, and I read that and I couldn't see the things I didn't know, you know, even when I was reading it, because I thought, oh, yeah, I know this. But then God reveals, I mean, I could write a book that Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit, I never knew. Even when I'd experienced him, I still didn't really know him. I was still framing my understanding of him through beliefs rather than relational experience. You know. And of course, fear is what is promoted to stop people engaging intimately and relationally because, well, you might be deceived. And Jesus gave us a clear, clear answer to that. Well, if you're seeking for the Father for something good, you're not going to get something bad. So trust him. Trust he's good. He's a good God. Well, actually, people don't trust that he's a good God. So they have to try and appease him. You know, it's like the parable of the talents. You know, some one man just buried it because he was fearful of the nature of God. And that was a lie. Someone must have told him that. Some religious person got him hooked back into a wrong understanding of God again, sadly. Yeah, Agnes, you got your hand up there. Yeah, hi, Mike. Hi, Ronald. Hi. Uh, thank you for the prayer of the, the communion prayer for the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to have an understanding of the difference between the mind and the brain as covered by the prayer because mm. it does talk about the brain and the mind yeah. and, you know everything that goes on so i just wanted to kind of have an understanding of what what is happening like what is covered okay well the brain obviously is an organ which has within it uh neurons and synapses and different ways in which thought can be transmitted. So electrical impulses to actually discern physically things that we see, hear, taste, touch, feel. So it's connected to the nervous system, which essentially passes information to the physical brain that gives us practical things, you know, like we can see. You know, and if you have a you have damage to that area of the brain, you can lose your sight even though your eyes are perfectly okay. You know, same with with hearing. You know, you can lose your ability to hear by having damage to the physical brain because there are areas in the physical brain which are connected to the physical body and the sort of autonomic nervous system, which means that we breathe and we uh, function and we don't have to think about it. You know, none of us has to think about, well, I need to digest my food. You know, or, you know, I, I need to actually be able to do these things. Our brain functions and there are certain areas which are linked to pituitary glands and they're, they're linked to the adrenal glands and they produce hormones that get the body to fight and flight and to freeze. And it's a physical thing. And there can be some things which are within that physical brain which do need rewiring and reconnecting because they can have memory and trauma uh, and various things which are connected to the physical brain. So there is an aspect of that, which I want my brain to be rewired and reconnected to make sure that the physical aspects of I am, got, I've got everything that I was supposed to have as created by God. So what did he create the physical brain to do? So I want that and whether there are capacities within the brain to other abilities that are within the physical brain that can be unlocked, I want all that. But then there is our mind or our consciousness, which is not limited to the physical brain because um, they don't know how the mind or consciousness actually works. <laughs> you know, no one really knows because it's a mystery. Is it associated with the brain? It, there does seem to be an association with thinking and various things, but it's, it's beyond that. Um, and there are also neuro, neurological cells within other parts of our body. So I think there's a Japanese lady, a Christian Japanese scientist, who basically talks about the three brains. We have the physical brain, we have the heart, which actually also has neurological cells and the gut. 
which also has neurological cells. And therefore, it's more complicated than just the brain itself, because I think memories are not just stored in the physical brain, but are connected to the cells of the heart. And therefore, there's something which connects spiritually and physically to the heart, which, which also has, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the mind can also be part of our subconscious. So we have the mind, which is conscious, the mind, which is subconscious, and the mind, which is unconscious. And all those are connected to different parts, I think, of our, the three brains. So our conscious mind is connected to our thinking, which is our physical brain. Our emotions are connected to our heart, which also has neurological power and actually produces an electromagnetic field, which is 10, 12 times stronger than that produced by the physical brain. So there's something about that which, which is powerful. And our gut, the instincts, the things which are, in a sense, unconscious, which actually keeps us functioning. Yeah, so all this stuff is quite complex, I guess. If you want to go into it in detail, the main thing is to make sure that we are not in any way damaged, hindered, restricted in our physical body, but also within our soul, our mind, emotions, our will, our, our actual subconscious mind, what's stored as memory, does not contain trauma, uh, does not contain negative things, negative emotions, hurts, pains, you know, which aren't physical. They can be stored in the physical body. So your physical body can have a reaction to something that's happened to you and you feel it in a physical way. So ultimately, we want to see our consciousness, the way we our mind works, having the mind of Christ, having the ability to think like a son of God and to create reality from our thinking using the sort of the quantum understanding of being able to shape things with our actual conscious mind our consciousness needs to expand beyond the limitations that have been placed on it by education or the brain or science or anything or religion to be free to expand so that we begin to take on the abilities of a son that has the ability and um, creative ability as does our father and jesus uh, who created everything uh, by using his thoughts and speaking the words that align with those thoughts to manifest. And I do believe that there's aspects of our brain and consciousness that need to be restored, made whole, that neural pathways linked to memories, linked to trauma, linked to other situations are broken open and new neural pathways linked to truth are formed so that we function as a whole being spirit soul and body mind emotions will choice all working together in a holistic way so that we shouldn't really have to think of all the individual parts when we're whole but because we're not whole we tend to think of well this bit isn't whole this bit isn't working that bit is like this or that or the other um, when you know part of the communion prayer is that our minds would be deconstructed from belief systems and value systems which are connected to things that we've repeatedly learned, which are stored in the hippocampus. You know, so those things which are important to us that we focused on are stored and they actually influence the things which we do and say and think. So let's make sure that all of this works together by having our minds renewed. You know, and that renewal be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So that's transformation, physical, spiritual, emotional, in all ways, spirit, soul, and body transformed, transfigured to radiate the, the light, the life, the love of God, the frequency of, of the very vibration of the truth uh, that we actually live in. So, yeah, I would sort of use the prayers, but make them your own in terms of how you use them to relate to how you see it. 
it's okay for you to have a particular perspective that God's given you that you apply, you use that. You know, you know, our consciousness certainly needs to catch up with its creative capacity. You know, I mean, if I don't know if you've seen the film Doctor Strange, um, which was the story of a of a surgeon, a highly skilled surgeon who loses the ability with his hands through an accident, in a car accident, and so struggles to use his consciousness and mind in a creative way because he's so used to doing it with his physical body so he's limited to what he believes he believes only in the empirical evidential of the physical realm of course he so loses his identity because his whole identity comes from him being a famous surgeon you know and a somewhat pompous and proud one at that um and somewhat arrogant in his uh, beliefs about his physical abilities that then when he loses them all he doesn't know who he is you know? and in the story he seeks for uh, revelation that would give him the ability to get back his physical uh, abilities um, and he meets a guy who um, used to be in a wheelchair but is walking you know, and he said, well, who, you know, I think he might have operated on him. Um, and he gets this sort of, uh, well, how are you walking? And he sort of gives him this inkling that it's to do with the power of the mind that has a greater power than the power of the body. And eventually he goes and finds that he has, can use his consciousness to do all sorts of amazing things in terms of creating and opening up portals to other realms and doing, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty spectacular sort of film in terms of its you know, special effects and stuff but it does again challenge the limitations that have been placed on because it's all about the physical rather than what the brain uh, with the consciousness has and it's a little bit you know like you know the brain sort of houses some of the capacities but it isn't it, the, the mind and the consciousness are beyond just a physical limitation of an organ into actually spirit you know it's really the, the car consciousness is a spiritual dynamic not a physical one um, but we do you know have the ability to start choosing a reality which aligns out of the heart of god and therefore we need to know how to focus our minds to do that you know, and to have our minds deconstructed from all the limitations and restrictions that have been put on us by the world, by science, by religion, by everything else. You know? um, so my deconstruction of the mind process um, you know, was a challenging one, um, but freed me to begin to see the possibilities that exist for our choice, you know, that we don't have to be limited by doing the same things and expecting different results, which is you know, the definition of insanity, um, but by having a new, renewed mind. And the renewed mind, you know, the whole word re repentance, metanoia, is a description of the renewed mind. It is with mind, with or in agreement with God, what God thinks. And when our minds agree and think and agreement with what God thinks, our capacity will be increased. And we will be able to see and say and do and see things manifested and changed um, from just choosing a reality with our power of our consciousness you know, which was you know in the in the dr strange film what he learned to harness and he, he went into a training place where he was able to practice that and we have to practice it you know, we have to practice training our senses to discern and to be able to choose and to be able to create, you know, which is what Hebrews 5, 14 says. You know, we, we practice. We need to become, you know, adults, mature and not babies. Keep asking God to do it all for us. You know, when he's calling us to mature and do it for ourselves, well, we never do that unless we're functioning with a creative capacity within our consciousness to choose realities 
uh, which are aligned to the heart of God. That's why relationship is so important. You know, relationship is the key to it because it unveils the reality of God's heart. And then whatever we do, we're doing in relationship with him and his heart, you know, with him, not for him, and not independently of him. You know? And that's the key of you know, having our minds and consciousness uh, restored and renewed. Thank you. Okay. There was an article that I published yesterday in, um, I think I wrote it yesterday in the ERC blog about cell memory. Hmm. It was quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which things are stored within the fabric of something, within the fabric of actual physical reality. Memories are stored. Everything that I've ever said in this room is stored within the actual physical makeup of this room. You know, it's just what happens. You know, it's like we learned to harness that by writing things using light on plastic discs and called them CDs and DVDs. It stores images, it stores sounds. You know, how does it do it? Well, it does it with technology, but actually that's just sort of harping back to the fact that all creation does that, which is why you can get some dark places and you can get some light places because there are things stored in the fabric of it, but you can deal with that and you can actually free things from that memory and cell memory is an important one. You know, sometimes our physical body you know, has a memory of what happened to us and yet that can be changed and transformed. And, you know, we get muscle memory. You know, when you do something and repeat something over and over again, you don't have to consciously think about what you're doing. Your muscle memory kicks in and you begin to automatically function out of that muscle memory. That's why athletes train. You know, they train to develop muscle memory so that their conscious choice is linked to the memory that their muscles have so the, that they work together in cooperation and people who you know have really good muscle memory like that it's like you know all sorts of you know there's like the european championship on with diving and things like that and i look at the man how do they do that you know but it's training practice and memory muscle memory that enables them to do those things in sequence gymnasts all those type of things you know, but that also means that some negative things can be stored within our memory of our cells and within our genetic material is a storage device. You know, DNA is a storage device, you know, and it stores the record of past generations and stores the record of epigenetic factors within generations. So memory actually is stored within the fabric of our being, whether it be our DNA and I think it is our DNA because it comes and it can be passed on from one generation to another, you know, and they, they do this with you know, animal experience. And I think they'd use rats or something and they um, did something that gave rats a certain chemical or whatever it was um, that created something bad, you know, um, in memory. And then the next generation avoided that thing instinctively, you know? And it was like, and they do, they've done lots of experiments like that to show that memory can be passed on genetically. Um, and therefore lots of other things can be passed on genetically as well, or epigenetically. And the whole thing of ge genetics happen, having to happen over, you know, millions of years of, you know, so in some way accidental evolution has been totally disproved. Now they know that genetic material can change in one generation to the next, you know, because it is stored and recorded, you know, but therefore we need to be able to use frequency, whether it be your oils or sound to free those memories, to free the trauma trap within cells, to free 
some of the negativity on the memories of generational things stored within families and passed on, we need to free people from it and bring people into the freedom um, that we have in our relationship with God. So the healing and the wholeness and, you know, we just see, had, you know, Carrie Browning here for a couple of weeks, you know, administrating that through ministering to people to help free them from the memories and the pain and the triggers that we carry. And she, she told some stories that, you know, where triggers are generational and, you know, we don't want triggers to be generational. We want our triggers to be through the Holy Spirit, to be through sons of God, you know, from the generations that come as, as in our sonship, not that come out of our earthly experiences. Um, but all this stuff, you know, science is discovering this, you know, um, and we need to make sure we, you know, take advantage of the discoveries and or have the revelation that God's given anyway and deal with these things. Let's not be subject to previous generational issues. Let's not be subject to the memory of trauma, which is, affects us with fear and doubt and unbelief and other things. You know, let's be filled with love and filled with you know, wholeness. Let's be full of peace. You know, you know, but it does require some transformation to take place. You know, transfiguration, transformation, whatever you want to call it, it is a metamorphosis, it is a change you know, at a genetic level, at a memory level, at a physical, emotional level, in every area, we need to be free from whatever it is that's holding us back to the past so that we can be free to pursue our destiny uh, in fulfillment of God's purposes within his overall desire for relationship and restoration of all things. You know, if we're not restored, creation is not going to be restored. Um, so, something strange that they found recently is that um, changes in the parents' DNA can affect the children, also the children who are already um, living. It's, um, uh, yeah, because I think it's a, it's a spiritual thing as well as a physical thing. Because epigenetic factors seem to be able to be passed even after children are born. You know, that seems, well, quantum physics basically proves that because it basically says things can be detected after it happened. You know, I mean, when they do these discovery, these things with sort of double slit experiments and things like that, they, they found that it's almost like this, whatever it is, actually knows what you're going to do before you do it and you can do it later and it seems to affect with the result of what happened in the past and they did this also in the power of consciousness in prayer when a guy did a, an experiment and he was trying to disprove the, the the effect of prayer positively and so he decided to do an experiment and he tried to make it really hard. <laughs> and so he got this group of people who were, um, I can't remember whether they're terminally ill or they were seriously ill, a group. And they were a whole group of patients. And he divided them arbitrarily into two groups. And he asked people to pray for one group and not the other. And then he looked at the results of those two groups to see whether prayer had an effect on the health of those in that group. What he didn't tell them was that those groups were actually that those two groups were from 10 years in the past. So he didn't he didn't know the result of these individuals who were who were either in some hospital department or something. I can't remember the exact details. But he didn't know, but he divided them arbitrarily and got them to pray. And he discovered that there was a, a statistically provable um, change for better in that that the group prayed for 10 years in, in the future. Because it isn't limited by the physical realm. In the quantum realm, of course, in God, everything is now. So what we do now because we're in him, can affect things 
in the past. Now, did it actually affect things and change the past? No, he didn't go and change. He, he just took a group of people. But actually, because we have access to be in the now of God, we've they, those prayers were always the things God used to bring health to those people. It's a weird thing, time, you know, so, you know, because we 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 operate and think linearly, whereas God is not linear outside of time and space. You know, it's it's all now. We go into the now, and then we can be used when we go into it. But of course, you're going into what's always now, so you can access the past, but it's always been the past to God because <laughs> it's all now. There is no now, past, future. It's all now. You know, so when you think, well, is the, does the future exist? It, it exists in the desire of God in the now. But he's constantly rewriting the now to, to weave our narratives and our mostly our stupid decisions and mistakes into the thing so we can still get the end result by bringing good out of it all. You know, which is, which is a good thing. You know, otherwise, we would get stuck you know, pretty quickly. But he has the ability to rewrite everything and weave our stories into the narrative of the whole, uh, because he's he's like constantly in a rewriting form, you know. And you get you know you can get there's a few science fiction films which sort of you know, and TV things which harp to that, you know, like Quantum Leap. I don't know if you can ever remember Quantum Leap, where this guy is involved in some quantum experiment and he end up he ends up getting lost, you know. And but God is basically div diverting him to go back into people and take over their consciousness for a period of time to to put things back in order, you know, which I think, yeah, that's, but but I think that's some of what people are doing today. I mean, I've done it lots of times now and other people have told me testimonies of being used to do these things. And it's a bit like quantum leap. You know, and there are other there's another one called Travelers. Uh, in which people are sent back by this cosmic computer, which you know, they call a computer, but is an analogy for God, and to go back and fix things that, you know, we're going to go, go astray. And so their consciousness are transported back into the physical body of a sub person who's just died. So they go back and inhabit their body, but they carry their consciousness from the future, which, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all sort of interesting but i think goes to show that there's more to all this than what we the limitations that have been placed on us you know, uh, you know um, god has used um, gary beaton in america to go back in time and um he goes back and he takes communion and he repents for certain things and um changes the future yeah and you know yeah, you know, has he changed the future, or has he dealt with the past so that the future can unfold? You know, because the I don't think the future. You know, otherwise, he, if someone did that, our all our minds would be rewritten. It's like if someone went back and stopped JFK being murdered. I mean, like, we would have no record of JFK ever being murdered, but you know, in a sense, would we? You know, because it would have never have happened. But actually, it would have happened to us. So something would have, if that was possible, then everything would have to be rewritten, which is why I don't believe you can change the past, but I do believe you can be used in the past. So he was used to see the things that were there and particularly understand the nature of what was intended and then deal with that intent so that, that intent was never manifested. So he short-circuited their attempts at doing something bad because he was able to, in that environment, go be used in it to make sure that that bad thing didn't happen. You know, that, that's, the, that's the reality, I think, of how it works. But it is, you know, quite a complex thing. And there are, most scientists will not agree on how time works or how it functions, whether it's a river you know, going one way or a continuum. You know, there are all sorts of different theories about it. Um, for me, I believe that we live in the present and have a past, 
and are creating the past every day we make every time we make a choice i don't believe our future exists personally because if it did we would it would be fate it will be fixed whereas we're involved in creating the future which then becomes history so we're history makers um, now it does exist within the desire of god's heart which is why we need to align ourselves with his heart so that what we do creates the future which is aligned to his heart you know, that that's how i see it you know and therefore prophecy is coming out of his heart not coming out of the future it's not like god you know and ultimately if you if you reach the speed of light which is the essence of god being light then everything is now that's what einstein said if you weren't and he didn't believe you could go faster than the speed of light um you know so he believed if you could approach the speed of light essentially everything would be now you know and you get that in different films and different things interstellar and all sorts of films which sort of you know are, are you know things i think just to get our minds starting to move to think hey there's a way there's a lot more in this um but i i personally believe that god has a desire he has incorporated us in that desire as his children and he wants us to outwork that desire and be those who establish that desire um, out into the physical dimension from his heart um, and therefore he's always rewriting our wrong choices that don't align his desire to weave them into the story so that that desire can still take place by bringing good out of the things we've done you know which is you know how, that's certainly how he showed me how things function so yeah quite an interesting uh, interesting journey we're on in terms of discovering as sons you know the the authority and the power we have within our relationship with God to effectively bring about his desires and that means to restore everything so that his desire will ultimately be at work which is why everything all things must be restored if that's going to take place how long that will take <laughs> is another matter but God doesn't see it so he's not concerned about time because it's all now this is the thing it's like he can be transcendent in the now and know everything and yet operate within the imminent of a moment and again quantum physically that's perfectly scientifically possible to be both all knowing and surprised you know because what operates within the non-local then becomes a moment within the local which doesn't have a past I mean, there's some good books out there on little books, which I've read, which are quite good on that. You know, one's called The Quantum Case for God, um, which says, you know, quantum physics and science does not disprove God. It makes God not just possible, but probable <laughs> from the way they look at it. It's just like, and we would say inevitable, <laughs> obviously. Um, who, who, is, who is that by? They are quantum it's by case. Dennis Zetting. Z Z and it's setting yeah you can get it on amazon i got it free oh. um, when they had one of their sort of you know i found it on facebook somewhere oh it's this free book so i downloaded it it's, it's not a long book but it's really good you know it's, it's quite a um written from a uh, perspective of um you know science is always used to disprove god but actually the more science discovers in the quantum realm it actually makes a strong case for god Right. and being the observer and all those type of things yeah. i remember a funny experiment we had in school with um i think we used a hamburger and a glass of milk mm. one was coursed and one was blessed mm. <laughs> one was coursed went sour after a couple of days and mm. one was blessed yeah well you've got all that stuff within you know dr emoto and the the uh, crystals of ice formed having had negative things spoken to water water is a fascinating subject substance um that we're made up of mostly water so there's something within the nature of water that you know we need insight into but again you know words spoken 
you know, music, yeah, rock music, music yeah. you know, um, you know, rock well, music. In fact, on trees, they, they put some plants with rock music and those one died and... They, yeah, yeah they all they sorts of different people. things. It does seem to have, a, have a, an effect which is beyond the, you know, the provable, you know, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at those sort of crystals that form as a result of positive and negative things, you know, one, one looked beautiful and the other looked, you know, a mess, you know, simply because it does respond to our words and our thoughts. Yeah. And we, uh, we need to take note of that and then learn to focus our thoughts and our consciousness. Because you know? if water responds like that, what else responds like that? Well, reality itself responds like that. When our bodies are 70% water. Or, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, what are we doing to our bodies by the way we think and what we say? You know? Are we bringing them into wholeness and health or are we creating negativity, lower frequency, therefore, you know, reducing our capacity, you know, as sons? in that way <laughs> all right. okay all right anything else okay all right okay i'll leave it there then it's uh